Thank you, Martin, for that. Um, yeah, as uh, Martin said, I, I wrote an introductory text to APL, and if you're impatient, you can find it here on the, this particular URL. Um, it looks a bit like this, um, so go go check it out. And if you have feedback or spot any errors, let me know. Uh, um, but yeah, so I'm Stefan Kruger. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I came to discover APL and uh, why I write, wrote a book about it. Um, and I guess this talk will cover cover the ground, sort of making up the first and the last chapters of the book, and then skipping out most of the actual APL bits in the middle. I guess I'm a computer scientist by background, a lapsed one. Perhaps I did a PhD on something about Fourier transforms back in the day. And I worked as a software developer since the late nineties in various shapes, languages, companies. And nowadays uh, I work for a very large international company making business machines. Um, and Ken himself used to work here. In my day job, I mainly help uh, customer engineering teams when they run into problems uh, using our products. And whilst I spent a long time in the business, I'm fairly new to APL. I'm, I'm one of those new APLs that uh, Martin talked about in a blog post uh, a few months back. And yeah, I make no excuses for robustly advocating for the Mac, Mac platform when it comes to uh, APL. So I discovered APL through a programming competition known as Advent of Code. Um, every December, there's an advent calendar of little code problems set two per day. And there's a bunch of us at work to take part. Uh, this is my completed 2015 uh, score sheet. If you like, uh, I didn't do it in 2015, but um, it's basically covering the topics that you'd expect to encounter in your first year of computer science, basic algorithms, data structures, sorting and searching and graphs and that sort of stuff, basic uh, computer science, but with a sprinkling of clever twists and, and uh, sort of data dependencies that you can exploit. A couple of them every year tend to be proper hard. Um, my solutions tend to run to about 20 to 100 lines of code in something like Python or Go. Um, but I was working my way backwards over the years where I hadn't taken part and I came across the following file. I could see that it said advent of code at the top. Um, and it was apparently written in language called K. Uh, I never heard of K and curiously, I couldn't really understand a single thing. And uh, normally I'd expect to be able to at least read most languages. Now this page ran to about a hundred lines of code or so, um, expect about what I expect a, a Python solution to one of the harder problems to come out at. Um, so which problem was this? Well, after a while it dawned on me that it was all of them. And I, and I just couldn't understand how this could conceivably be possible. Um, I started digging a bit and someone told me that K was an extremely stripped form of APL, but with a bit of inspiration from Lisp and no funky glyphs. I had actually heard of APL back in my university days and it really kind of piqued my, my interest. I wanted to know more. And as it turns out, um, APL is the daddy, the, the OG of array languages, if you like. And it appeared to me that, that if I want to explore this style of programming, going back to the roots seemed to be the, the kind of way to go. Um, and as a casual observer, it was love at first sight, uh, the expressive power, the pretty glyphs, and you can see some of my favorites here on the screen. I think especially uh, this one, the, the selfie, and uh, to me, it symbolizes my face through my, 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 le my learning process. But for me, the feeling was that APL was all like magic runes chiseled by Viking mages into slabs of granite, and it, it, it really felt at the same time both ancient and, and modern. Um, now this particular stone, um, the inscription can be written out something like this. Um, uh, and if you evaluate it, you get the following matrix back. Um, experts still debate on what the numbers mean, but uh, the Vikings clearly understood one or two things about array-oriented programming. As APL users, like, we're all aware that, that it has a bit of a reputation. Um, you may have heard that it's for mathematicians. Um, or that it's unreadable. This frequently crops up on Hacker News whenever it's mentioned. It's right only, um, or perhaps it's impossible to learn, um, and that its community is uh, a council of wizards. Um, now, one of these statements is absolutely true. Um, I, I certainly felt like there's a secret guild of array magicians hiding in plain sight, uh, speaking in tongues. And from Latvia to South Korea via India and Portugal, they walk amongst us. 
and uh, they gather in obscure corners uh, of the internet. Another thing that you hear as an APLR is that it's a dead language, the, the Latin of programming, if you like, or at best a living fossil. And whilst it's not perhaps topping any popularity lists, it's certainly alive and well, and perhaps a language whose time has come. APL offers unprecedented mechanical sympathy, people say, to modern processes. Now, I came across a couple of quotes when I was preparing this presentation that I'd like to share with you. Um, Justin Etheridge um, was actually talking about relational databases, but I think his point is valid for APL too. Um, the kind of technology world goes through an, an extremely rapid change and surviving technologies have survived for a reason. And perhaps it's worth thinking about APL as a shark rather than like a dinosaur. Another quote that resonated with me is from Aaron Zhu, uh, and you've probably heard it before, uh, but he said that good APL follows a set of best practices that directly contradict and conflict with traditional programming wisdom. Indeed, APL design patterns appear as anti-patterns in most other programming languages. And this sort of cognitive dissonance is one of the reasons why some computer people really hate APL. Um, like this guy, the self-styled godfather of computer science, Edsger Dijkstra. Uh, and uh, Dijkstra said many things about APL, not a single one of them flattering. Um, a bag of tricks, he said, uh, encouraging the programmer to think of, pro of problems as puzzles, requiring them to find the correct trick rather than to express their ideas elegantly. And I think it's fitting that the algorithm with, which bears his name is quite in, infuriating to implementing APL uh, even today without resorting to tradfans and uh, iterative techniques. But for me, this kind of amounts to the main draw of APL. Um, I interpreted Aaron's words as learning APL today is really an act of rebellion. It's a hard no to verbosity, gang of four design patterns, object orientation nonsense. It's two fingers to megabytes of code to do the simplest of tasks. I really felt like I'd come home. So I set about trying to teach myself APL and I've taught my, myself countless programming languages over the years and how, how, how hard can it be? Um, well, the things I thought were gonna be hard, um, they, weren't, they weren't the hard bits at all, um, like learning to type APL on a keyboard. Um, everybody is always banging on about what a barrier of entry this is, and it's not really. Um, it takes a day or two to learn where the most useful glyphs reside, and um, the rest you can just pick from the, uh, the language bar if you have to. And at the same time, figuring out what the glyphs actually mean, I think in this regard, um, APL is actually easier than the situation that we have in J or K, even, those long, even though those languages use normal symbols. And going with the execution flow of APL, that soon comes naturally too. Um, now, there were, of course, hard bits too, and the actual hard bits were things I didn't even know existed when I set out. Um, like data, parallel problem solving, thinking in arrays, the core of APL, if you like. And in the beginning, I desperately grasped for the iterative parts of APL, leading to code that's both ugly and slow. And solving problems the APL way feels incredibly alien at first. Fast idiomatic APL is crushingly slow if you translate it to another language. And conversely, techniques that are fast in other languages are slow um, uh, in APL. And this takes some time to sink in. Pardon my cat there. <laughs> um, and at a more microscopic level, um, dialogue has magic optimizations here and there, and hitting those mostly by luck can really make your code fly. And change a single glyph, and it crawls. And I still struggle with this from time to time. Um, and reading tacit code um, is quite hard for me still a few years down the line. Um, powerful, compact, efficient, sure, easy to read, write and understand. Well, it makes me appreciate better what it must be like being dyslexic. Um, here's a train that I picked from Apple Cart, and you might be able to understand that at a glance, but I'd still resort to pen and paper to trace this through. Um, in fact, we can make this a little exercise for you, uh, a conference mini challenge, if you like. Um, take that train and rewrite it to a defun. You can you can have the um, the past tree too. Um, we can return perhaps to this at the at, at the at the end of this talk. Um, I'll leave the train up on the next few slides uh, if you want to write down. But 
fundamentally, um, APL is a beautiful thing. Um, and one thing that struck me is that there didn't seem to be any kind of introductory texts to, to, to APL that I can find, at least none that really spoke to me. Um, so I like to learn from books and my bookshelf contains some classics that I've accumulated over the years. And as a reader, I, I already know how to program. Um, I am quite impatient as a, re as, as, as a reader. I, I want to learn quickly. Um, I like to learn from examples. I like to sort of pour over so, so, some code and, and try and figure out how it works. Um, there is, of course, mastering dialogue at APL, but when I set out, it was kind of outdated in terms of the, the version of dialogue that it was supported. It's very long, um, and it devotes a kind of large volume of pages to the parts of dialogue that I wasn't really ready to tackle. Um, but I'd like to highlight Rodriguez's efforts on, on bringing um, the APL into the modern era. I think it's going to make, make a huge difference there. But here are some examples of books that I've read and enjoyed when learning new languages at the time. And they're, they're kind of focused, not exhaustive, a bit humorous and examples led. And I think the airline book uh, in the middle there is especially good, uh, I think. So it struck me, could this be a way that I could contribute to the APL uh, community rather than to sit on my ass whinging about the lack of books? You know, putting aside to uh, one moment the fact that I barely know the language. Um, and as Ken himself probably never said, although I think he probably should have done, is, is that asking not what APL can do for you, but what you can do for APL. Now, I've not written any books on programming languages before, but I've written lots of other stuff over the years, scientific papers, oodles of blog posts on various topics, a PhD thesis, technical documentation, that sort of stuff. But I need the plan and I needed to seriously upskill my, my, my uh, APL if this is gonna be meaningful. Um, I'm gonna spare you most of the details of that process, but starting from zero, I, I set out kind of plowing through the back catalog of, of apple orchard cultivations. Uh, and if you're not familiar with those, they, they are Adam's impromptu uh, fast paced lecture series covering basically the whole of dialogue and it's a gold mine uh, for the learner. Um, I then set about reading every APL related paper I can find by Roger Huey. Um, Roger obviously very sadly passed away recently, yes, which is a huge loss for, for the Ray community, but his, his papers is a, is a true treasure and he writes really, um, the way he writes is it, it speaks to the beginner too. Like even I, I, as I was learning, I, I find his papers very useful. Um, and also they form like a, a thread, a thread in time over the development of APL. But the bulk of, uh, the bulk of my work was doing various uh, uh, problem collections, um, including redoing all of Advent of Code uh, every, every year since 2015. This process took me best part of a, uh, of a year, kind of chipping away at it a little, little bit every day. I do have, sort of have a day job too. Um, but some of the ASC ones were, were pretty hard going for my uh, lacking skills, um, even if I'd done them before. And I, when I look through my AOC solutions now, I can kind of see my own skills improving over time, which is quite, quite uh, interesting to see. Um, and at some stage, I just decided to start writing, learning on a job, hoping for the best. Um, and actually the act, the, the, the act of writing is, is also a really powerful way of learning. Um, I found that I had to go back set several times to the earlier chapters and revise them as my, as my kind of skills in, improved. So looking back, what did, what did I learn from this? Um, well, I did pick up APL, we'll be pleased to hear, and it's an invaluable tool to have in your tool chest. And whilst my progress has its ups and downs, ultimately it's not that different from learning any other language. Um, but I think I've become a better programmer, full stop, if I may say so myself. Um, I think the most surprising thing is that I have a whole new problem solving approach available to me now, even as I work in other languages. Um, the kind of APL ideas uh, kind of are universal and, and, they're, and they're very uh, a very kind of useful uh, tool to have uh, in the back of your head. And I think APL kind of fits my mindset, um, but I also like tinkering with regular expressions, so perhaps this says more about me than about APL. 
So I'd like to change tack for a little bit uh, and talk about the friction points that I experienced uh, in this process. Um, and I don't really need, need to talk about the sharp corners of APL itself. Um, you're already familiar with the, what those are and the reasons why dialogue are wary of smoothing them off perhaps yeah. And let me also stress that what follows are my extremely biased observations from a kind of new APL uh, perspective um, and to make things even more complicated on a Mac. And what follows this based on the current version of, of, of Dialogue. Um, John's talk just now addresses some of the, the issues um, that, that I'm about to talk about, but we can uh, put that one to, 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 to the back of our minds for, for a minute. But fundamentally, the, the truth is that for me, it's been quite awkward to fit Dialogue into a modern workflow. Um, and obviously for some definition of modern there, um, Emacs was, born in 1978, BIM in 1991, Git 2005, years ago 2015. Um, but text is actually an excellent medium in which to store source code and all tools are based on this assumption on, on, on the machine that I'm using at least. But somehow this is kind of past APL's parallel universe by um, and Dialog is now on its 18th major release and it's only just about starting to catch up. Um, now it can obviously be done. Um, and to, to show you a little bit on, on what's required on a Mac today to, to work with code as text um, as it stands. And here's what I needed to do. I needed to start off with installing a separate application stack, uh, Microsoft.NET Core. I need to try and install the latest version of the link library, which is tricky enough on a Mac given uh, where, where and how it installs. If you're lucky, um, the version of the uh, dialogue that you use has the right uh, link library included. Then you need to use the link uh, library to map a directory on disk containing my code into a namespace in the interpreter. And to execute a text file from the terminal command line pre the current betas on a Mac, I think you're out of luck. Um, but to be fair, once link is set up, um, it works nicely. And in my beta version of 18.1, link is finally bidirectional on a Mac. This means I can edit code with external tools. I can even interpret to do the right thing. But I think my point is that you have to be a pretty sophisticated dialoguer to get to this point. Whereas I would expect that this to be the kind of entry, entry level grand, 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 grand floor, if you like. And I really had no particular desire to install a complete .NET stack on my machine just for this. If we compare the situation to other dynamic languages, uh, you point the interpreter at a file and it starts at the top and it evaluates the code it finds line by line until it either finishes or crashes. It's a pretty nice and simple model. But as we just saw uh, in John's talk, um, great things are coming. And in the current betas, you can do pretty much the same thing um, uh, with IPL. And I'm really excited about this. And this is like a game changer. For, I think the 18.2 release will make great strides in, in terms of practical usability. Um, it's gonna be the greatest dialogue yet. But my plea to dialogue uh, boils down to this. Um, make it easier for me to use the tools that I already use. Be a good citizen on, on the platforms that you support. Uh, make it easy to integrate, cooperate and communicate with common tools protocols and systems. Let me edit and debug APL with the editors uh, I already know how to use and I use by millions of users. And be better at Mac. Uh, I think the Mac is the third platform for dialogue in, in every sense of the word. Um, and software engineers in big companies use Macs, uh, even if they never develop a single line of software for the Mac. And why is this? Well, even though they're uh, expensive, they're uh, very cost effective and easy for enterprise IT departments to manage and deploy. And where I work, uh, we develop on Mac and we deploy to Linux containers in the cloud. Um, but the Mac is a Unix workstation in the same way as any Linux box. It, it really is. And it's not, it's not an appliance and please don't treat it as one. Um, I think Dialog's view is that business Finance users use Windows and engineering science users use Linux. And I'm not quite sure what Dialog think it's kind of users use MacOS. Um, 
I'd like to challenge this assumption as I think it's a, a kind of missed opportunity for, for dialogue. The way dialogue installs on a Mac makes it very difficult to use for kind of multi-engineer software development projects as I can't realistically use it from the command line. It's impossible, or at least until the, the, the upcoming changes, to string together um, dialogue components in, in, in polyglot pipelines. I'd like you to treat the Mac exactly like you treat Linux. Um, I have just about a dozen or so different language interpreters and compilers installed on this machine that I'm giving this presentation from, all of which install on the Mac, just like they, they do on Linux. And as a bonus, I think this will make Dialog's own release engineering uh, um, simpler too. So some final thoughts. Um, I've really enjoyed my own uh, APL journey enormously. It has forced me to re-examine some calcified patterns in my own brain on what programming should be like. I only wish that I discovered it earlier. And writing a book is an excellent way of learning APL too. Uh, when you write a book notionally for others, you soon discover the bits that you don't actually understand and you can't really move on um, until you do if you're trying to explain it to someone else. And if a single person find it useful, um, for me, this process has been worth it. But the truth is, I'm not really a traditional dialogue user. Um, I don't build big GUI-driven applications in OOAPL. I'm not a domain expert, uh, even though I'm not quite sure what that actually means um, in the dialogue sense. Um, but my hope is that Dialog sees a future for APL as a tool, also for the rest of us, um, coders, toolsmiths, data analysts, ad hoc scripters in polyglot environments. We really see APL as a refuge from the ills of OO um, and as an elegant weapon for a more civilized age. So that's kind of the end of um, the, the, main, the main part of this. I promised we'd uh, return to um, the, the conference mini challenge. Has anyone got any idea what this uh, little train does? Martin, have you got any ideas? Um, it's basically an expression that trims leading, trailing and repeated uh, characters given by the left argument from the right arguments. And I'll show you the defund that I gave in the book and you'll probably have something smarter by now. It looks a bit like this, but if we line them up, um, we can see uh, you know, a little bit better how they relate together, perhaps. Um, which is preferable? Well, I, I think I'll leave that one hanging. Um, we will have our, our, our own opinions there, perhaps. Well, it's, it's not fair since I'm the only person who can answer at the moment. <laughs> the defund is clearly uh, preferable to me. Um, I mean, you leaked this to me ahead of, of uh, the presentation, and you may remember that I was completely confused by the, the not equals at the end of this expression. It never occurred to me that that was a dyadic not equals and that the argument was to be fetched from the, the other end of this. Um, and that my problem with, with trains, I think I've identified, is the number of ambiguities that are caused by not knowing when you see an expression like this, whether it's uh, monadic or dyadic, or perhaps intended to be ambivalent, which gives this explosion of possibilities as you go along the, the train. But uh, I suspect we agree on that. Yeah, I, 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 I think so too. Um, just before I go, um, I'd just like to extend my heartful thank you to Rodrigo and Rory um, who time to really help me proofread uh, this material. Uh, any remaining errors or lies, they're, they're, they're nothing to do with them. They're, 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 I take full responsibility for those. And the whole lot of the Apple Orchard, um, it's an, the Apple Orchard chat room is, a, is an invaluable um, resource for, for anyone learning. And the people who hang out there are both exceptionally competent and very open to uh, beginner questions and it's been a really positive experience finding that place when, when learning APL so thank you to you to everybody who hangs out there and again you know go and have a look 
uh, at the book. Uh, and if you have any uh, comments, find errors and stuff, let me know. So thank you very much. And if there are any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer those if we have any time left. Yeah, there was a question about where to find it. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, but you've just answered that. Um, <laughs> I, I don't have a question. I do have a comment, though. I read the text and there were, I, it never occurred to me that this was written by a beginner. It's like, wow. <laughs> well, I, I guess I've, I, got a, I, I, I was a beginner when I, start, when I started, but I guess I was no longer a beginner when I finished. But, but um, uh, it's, uh, it's been with me for, for at least through the, the two years of lockdown and probably a little bit longer. So, yeah. And your recommendation is that we now all go out and read a book because it's a really good way to understand <laughs> everything you need to know. <laughs> well, it's, it's one option. Other people write their own in APL interpreters, but uh, I think this felt more meaningful for me. Yeah. Well, I mean, I certainly thank you for the, the book. This is a, something that I don't think we could have produced at Dialogue because it requires the perspective uh, that you have. Uh, and I'm also I'm taking notes as you as you talk. We clearly have miss. I don't know whether we've misidentified the Mac user, but we certainly, in all the work we did initially on the Mac, the the idea was that it was an appliance and not a computer. Um, <laughs> yeah. If you've seen John Scold's plea for simplicity, uh, you'll understand a little bit of where we were coming from uh, on that. I think we may need to see the Mac as two different platforms, uh, the appliance and the, the tech-savvy tech user. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of things would, if you separated the, the install image with the interpreter itself and, and, and ride, and so that the interpreter could reside in a more kind of Unix-y um, place, um, yep. it would make it easier for, think, for things like Link uh, to update and, yep, I can. Um, APL code as well. So. Can definitely see that. There are a couple of questions come in now. Aaron Zhu asks, where do you plan to take your APL journey? You have one minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, my, my, my APL uh, journey next will, my, inspira my, uh, my aspiration is to understand the code that you've written, Aaron. Yeah, I think that, then uh, my, my, uh, my journey will be complete. Okay, and there's a question from uh, Ezekiel. I don't know. Are you able to read the questions? Do you have them up on your screen? Uh, let me have a look. Um, the question is whether, yeah, you have it, or do you want? Yes. To um, would something like uh, uh, a plugin help in AI? I, is that for me? Uh, don't know. Yeah, actually, I. I, 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 I I don't know what that is, I'm afraid. So I can't okay. answer that we may question. need to deal with that in the chat later. Anyway, yeah. thank you. That was uh, that was brilliant, both the book and the presentation and the and the input. Thank you very thank much. You.